So we're going to switch over to different molecules. But for, before we do, I just wanted to do a review of what we just did. So what kind of molecules were we just building? Proteins. Proteins, yep. And the building blocks of proteins are called? And amino acids have three different parts. What are they? Yep, yep. So amino acids have an amino group, an acid group, and a side chain, right? What part is different for different amino acids? Side chain. The side chain. Excellent. It's what makes amino acids unique. All right, so as Kathy said before, Almost everybody recognizes this. So what kind of molecule is this? DNA. This is DNA. Yep. Uh, does anybody know what the building blocks of DNA are called? Nucleic acids, Nucleic acids or nucleotides, Nucleic. right? Either one. Uh, does anybody know what the three parts of a nucleotide are? Phosphate is one. Yep. Sugar and the base. Yep, the phosphate, the sugar, and the base. Excellent. Okay, so what I'm gonna have you do is we're gonna pass out uh, the DNA kits and the DNA booklets. If you would, again, please just open up both pages. Here is one essential tool that teachers need to know in order to manage the classroom. So this is the kit care record, and you can see, you can get it downloaded online and uh, designate whether it's going to go in the DNA, protein, or tRNA set, and the kit number. So students should receive a kit that looks like this with the folded kit check inside of it. And at the beginning of class, student teams should be instructed to fill it out, uh, looking at each of the pieces and recording if anything is missing. So the date, their names. If there's nothing missing, they should make sure to write the word OK in here, so we will know it's been checked. So they filled out the form and they do it this way by checking the label here and making sure the right pieces are here. And uh, working with a partner, this can take just one or two minutes. So they, it will get to be a habit at the beginning of each class. And then put the pieces back together at the very end and put it in. The end of the class is usually pretty rushed so we don't end up doing a kit check at the end. But you can see when the next class comes in and they write their names on it and they check it out, they will know, it, there will be a record whether there's anything missing after it's used. So the purpose of this again is that you will always be able to have a good class without interruptions for any missing articles in the lesson plans. So the same system can be used for the DNA and RNA kit. So you can see it here, you put the number on and mark it that it belongs with the DNA and RNA. And uh, in this case, uh, you have the label on the inside. And sometimes these smaller pieces we put in a bag so you can take them out if you're not using them. They're only used in, in some of the advanced lessons. OK, so then the last thing I'd like to point out is the tRNA, tRNA sets that can be used by the teachers. If you are sharing your set, sometimes it's really nice to have a teacher record of who's used it and how they've been set up last. So anyway, this is something that uh, you should not uh, ever be without because this really helps you manage things easily. Please go ahead and open your DNA booklet to page two and three. So it should look like this. The DNA kit, just like the protein kit on the inner lid, there's actually a label that looks like that that shows you where different things should go. So the first thing I wanted to point out, go ahead and open your kit. Go ahead, flip it open. First thing I wanted to point out is we have both DNA and RNA in your kit, all right? So the RNA is orange, orange RNA. So we are not gonna touch the RNA for now. We're just gonna be working with the DNA first. We'll work with the RNA later. But I would like each person to grab a DNA nucleotide adenine out of your kit. Alrighty, so uh, if everybody could hold it up by the sugar group, which is that dark gray box on the bottom. So the dark gray box on the bottom, that's the sugar, yeah? 
So go ahead and hold it by the phosphate group, that's the light gray cylinder on the side. And then hold it by the base, which is the part with the color and letter and arrow. Excellent. So uh, what's different about different DNA nucleotides? The sugar, the phosphate, or the base? The base, right. And how many different bases do we have just in DNA? Four. Four. And what are those letters? ATGC, right? There are fancier names, but generally we're just going to call them by their nicknames, ATGC. The MIT Edgerton Center presents Introduction to Nucleotides to be used with the MIT Edgerton Center DNA set. Every DNA double helix is made from the same building blocks. These building blocks are called nucleotides. There are four DNA nucleotides, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and adenine. All nucleotides have three parts, the sugar, the phosphate, and the base. The sugars and phosphates create a strong backbone and the bases join the two strands that twist into the DNA double helix. I would like each person to take out one of each DNA nucleotide and have them in front of you. So you should have an A, a T, a G, and a C in front of each person. All right, so what are the three parts of a nucleotide again? Sugar, phosphate, base. Excellent. And which part is different for different nucleotides? The base. Great. So I would like you to look at the four bases that you have in front of you. Are the bases all the same size? Which bases are larger? The A and the G are larger. So if you could turn in your booklet to pages four and five. So you'll see the chemistry, right? Just like we looked at the chemistry of the amino acids, now we're looking at the chemistry of nucleic acids. So uh, if you look below, the part in the dark gray box again is the sugar. The phosphate group is a light gray part in the box. And then the part with the colored box is the base. So I want you to look at the A and the G bases in the chemistry and the C and the T, and tell me why we made A and G larger in the models. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have like two bases? Two rings. Yeah, exactly. Yes, excellent. So if you look in, uh, in DNA, the A and the G bases have two rings of atoms, right? Those are called purines. And the C and the T only have one ring of atoms each. So they're called pyrimidines. All right, so what I'd like you to do now is take the four DNA nucleotides that you have in front of you, and I'd like you to try and put them together in like a very tiny little ladder structure. It is key that every student experience this exercise. Make sure each student has their own four DNA nucleotides at the start. Ask each student to make a small DNA ladder using all four nucleotides. The purpose of this activity is not to test who knows the correct base pairs. The purpose is to discover why some bases will pair and some will not. Invite students to experiment and to find different ways to form a DNA ladder. This means students who have not yet learned the correct base pairs are not singled out. The correct DNA ladder structure is shown on page 6, along with an incorrect structure. Use this incorrect DNA structure to demonstrate the key points in front of the class. Large bases pair with small bases, and DNA is anti-parallel. For a more advanced class, this activity is a good time to introduce the 3' prime and 5' prime ends of DNA and the number of hydrogen bonds for each base pair. Both can be found in DNA RNA Booklet 2. Did anybody make this mistake? 
purposefully or non-purposefully? Yeah, a couple of people. Great. So what is wrong with this structure in terms of DNA? Yeah. Well, A doesn't go with G, and so that's messing up the, the structure, and it doesn't become a, um, it can't, like, become a helix, a double helix. Right, right. So, so the structure, because we've got A and G together, and those are the big bases, that screws up the DNA structure, right? So DNA is supposed to be parallel, right? But this is not parallel. So when we make base pairs, we can't pair the two big ones together or it's too fat. And we can't pair the two small ones together or it's too thin. So we need to actually base pair a big with a small. So what are the correct base pairs? A with T and C with G. Yep, excellent. So uh, I'm gonna come around. What else do you notice, particularly maybe about the arrows on my DNA structure? Yeah, exactly. So they go opposite directions, right? These nucleotides are going this way. These nucleotides are going this way, right? Kind of like a two-way street. So that is why DNA is called anti parallel. It's because the nucleotides are going in opposite directions as opposed to the same direction. The MIT Edgerton Center presents Building a DNA Double Helix to be used with the MIT Edgerton Center DNA set. DNA is anti-parallel. Make sure the arrows on your bottom strand are pointing right and the arrows on your top strand are pointing left. Don't connect the base pair first. This makes it harder to add nucleotides. Don't bend the DNA strands. Do attach the phosphate to the sugar first, and then connect the base pair. Continue adding nucleotides along the top strand according to the base pairing rules. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. When you finish the top strand, twist the DNA to make a double helix. DNA is called a double helix because the two strands of DNA twist around each other in a spiral shape. So what you'll see on page 7 is the start of a DNA double strand. And so I'd like each person to build this individually. So you're going to build that bottom strand paying attention to the arrows. And then, since you know what the correct base pairs are, you can actually fill in the top strand. So each person, go ahead and build this individually. Make sure you pay attention to the arrows in the picture. All right, so once you've built the bottom strand, go ahead and fill in the rest of the top strand. Right? What are the correct base pairs again? A goes with T and G goes with C. And again, remember to pay attention to the arrows. So the arrows on the top strand should be going a different direction than the arrows on the bottom strand. So you want to snap? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All 
All right, there are a couple of things that I'd like you to do with your DNA now. The first one is you're gonna grab either end on the table and you're gonna kind of push them in a little bit towards each other. And that way it makes it easier for you to pick them up and twist them. So go ahead and do that. So here is the double helix, right, that's talked about. So why is it called a double helix? What do we have two of? Two strands, right? One strand, second strand. So if you look down the strand, what parts of the nucleotides did you connect together? Sugars. sugars and phosphates, right? So this is also sometimes called the sugar phosphate backbone. If you've heard that, that's what it's talking about. It looks a little bit like a spine, right? And you connected the base pairs in the middle. The MIT Edgerton Center presents Opening DNA, Hydrogen Bonds, to be used with the MIT Edgerton Center DNA set. Practice opening the DNA. Unsnap the DNA by pinching and pulling up on the sides of the DNA ladder. The two strands will pop apart easily. Snap your DNA strands back together again. Practice opening and closing the DNA strands. Don't pull the two strands apart. Do pinch and pull up on the sides of the DNA ladder. Always open your DNA using this technique. The ball and socket joints between the base pairs represent hydrogen bonds. The connections between the sugar and phosphate groups represent covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are stronger than hydrogen bonds. This is why hydrogen bonds are easily created and easily broken. Why does DNA need to open up? Replication to make more DNA, transcription to make mRNA, and repair to fix damaged DNA. Each student needs to practice opening and closing the DNA strands several times using the pinch and pull up technique. This will reinforce the nature of hydrogen bonds, easily created and easily broken. The pinch and pull up technique decreases the wear and tear on the models. The DNA base pairs were not designed to be pulled apart. Instead, the bases were designed to pop apart easily. Remind students to use this technique whenever they are opening up DNA strands or putting away the DNA pieces. All right, so go ahead and lay it flat back down on the table. The next thing I'd like you to do is open it, which we have a special way that we're actually opening these. So I want you to grab either strand like this, and then I'd like you to pinch and pull up, and they should snap apart very easily. So grab both sides, pinch and pull up, and they should come apart very easily. So go ahead and do that once or twice, practice it a couple of times. Snap them back together. Ah, the sounds of base pairing. All right, so go ahead and put your DNA back together. Now that you've practiced it a couple of times. What kind of bond is in between these sugars and phosphates here? Or what it's called? So it's with a C? Covalent. I heard it somewhere over here. Covalent bonds, right, are between the sugar and the phosphate. What kind of bonds are in between the base pairs? Hydrogen bonds, yep. Which are stronger, hydrogen bonds or covalent bonds? Covalent bonds. Covalent bonds. Hydrogen bonds are actually relatively weak as bonds go. So that means that it's very easy to open up and close the DNA, right? They're easily made and easily broken. Why is it a good idea for DNA to, to be able to open up and close back easily. 
There are three main reasons, yes. Doesn't it allow uh, for the cell to replicate easier? Replication, yep. DNA needs to make a copy of itself, right? And so it needs to open up to do that. So number one is replication. Why else does DNA need to open up? Yeah. Exactly, to make an, an RNA copy. So that's called transcription. Does anyone know the third? No, nope, translation doesn't occur on the DNA. You have a guess? Yeah. What's that? Well, that's what happens when you, when you transcribe it. So we're going to make an RNA copy of the info, and then that's going to go out to the ribosome. Yeah. I don't know, it's not your fault. Is it to repair the DNA? Yes, it is. Excellent guess. Yeah, DNA needs to open up to repair itself often. So DNA replication, transcription, and repair. Fantastic. In this workshop, we chose not to teach DNA replication. However, DNA replication can be taught at this point using pages 10 through 13 in DNA RNA Booklet 1. The replication activity in Booklet 1 is a basic version meant to emphasize that DNA replication is semi-conservative. An advanced replication activity using triphosphates and modeling leading and lagging strands is found in DNA RNA Booklet 2. So what you've built now is actually a very, very, very small gene. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and combine it with your partner's gene. So click them together. So now everybody has their, their two genes together, right? They're two small genes. So what do you have in front of you now? What's a piece of DNA that has many genes connected together? Anybody know? I heard it somewhere. Chromosome. Yes, excellent. So a chromosome is a longer piece of DNA that has a ton of genes, right, all connected together. So uh, while we're talking about, so what, what is a gene anyway? What's a gene? Yeah. Um, not quite. It has something to do with proteins. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, it's, so it's information about proteins. Right? That's what the DNA has. So one gene has the information to build how many proteins, generally? One. Generally, one gene, one protein. There are exceptions. But if you have one gene, what you have is the instructions for how to build a protein. So this is why people make such a big deal about DNA. It's really the proteins that are actually going along in the cell, doing all the amazing work that our cells need to do, keeping us alive. But DNA is the molecule that is keeping the information, the instructions for how to make all of those proteins to make sure that we work correctly. Does that make sense? Excellent. OK, so now what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a slightly larger gene. Um, we're going to actually give you the gene either for the alpha chain or the beta chain that you made before in the proteins, in the channel protein, right? So you both, each of you made an alpha and a beta. So we're either going to give you the gene for the alpha or the gene for the beta. What I'd like you to do is build the gene directly on top of the gene strip, which is what we're handing out. It's life size. So you're going to need to take apart that sequence and build the new one on the strip. Again, pay attention to the arrows. Pay attention to the arrows on the strip and on your nucleotides. All right, once you've made your gene, please double check it with your strip. You want to make sure you have exactly the same sequence. Now what I'd like you to do is on your strip, on the left-hand side of your strip, there's a little title, and it will tell you if this is 
alpha or beta that you've built. So who has alpha? So this whole side of the room, you're building alpha, right? You've got the alpha gene. And who has beta? Yep, this whole side of the room has beta. Excellent. Um, but we were, uh, we were a little sneaky. And so some of you actually have mutated genes. If you have a big red box around your title and a big red box somewhere in your gene sequence, that means you are mutated. Congratulations. Uh, so we're going to see what happens when you mutate the gene that has the instructions for the protein. So MIT Edgerton Center presents Decoding a Gene to be used with the MIT Edgerton Center DNA set. Build the DNA on top of your gene strip. Check that the nucleotides match the strip exactly. Notice the DNA nucleotides on the bottom of your gene strip are marked in groups of three with dark gray boxes. A group of three nucleotides is called a codon. Each codon codes for a different amino acid. DNA is decoded by reading the gene in the direction of the arrows on the nucleotides. Your first codon should read ATG. Use the chart of DNA codons on page 21 to find the correct amino acid. Select the codon card for methionine and slide the card under the gene strip. Continue decoding the DNA nucleotides. Read each codon, find the correct amino acid for that codon, and slide the matching codon card under the gene strip. Repeat this process until you have finished decoding the gene. Look at the order of the amino acids. Imagine they are joined together in a chain. The order of the DNA nucleotides determines the order of the amino acids in a protein chain. So what I'd like you to do is uh, go ahead and look on your gene strip. And at the bottom, there are these dark boxes that have numbers in them. They say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Why did we group them by threes? So a codon, which is three, three nucleotides, three bases, right, codes for one amino acid, right? So one, two, three, that's going to be the first codon. What does everybody have, actually? You're going to read the bottom strand of your DNA, left to right, like a sentence, three at a time. So what are the, what's the first codon? What are the letters? ATG. ATG. So everyone should have ATG as their first codon. In general, that is the first codon for every gene, right? Genes start with ATG. That's like the start. So if you take your booklet and turn to page uh, 21, somebody tell me what amino acid ATG codes for. A little louder. Methionine. Methionine. Yes, thank you. So what Kathy is handing out uh, are codon cards that look like this, that have different amino acids on them. So what you're going to do is you're going to look up the codons that you have, find the amino acids that they code for, and slide them underneath your gene strip, but not too far. You want to make sure that you can still see what amino acid it is. All right, so go ahead and use page 21 and your codon cards to decode your gene.
There we go. So you want to slide it underneath just a little bit. Oh, okay. There we go. So it doesn't go anywhere. So which one's the first one? Yeah. So who has methionine? Ah, okay. So you want to go, that's where that one belongs. So then CCC. Pro is right here. CCT. Or CCC. The first thing I want you to notice, what's the first amino acid that you all have? Methionine, right? That's the start of each gene is methionine. What's the last card that you all have? Stop. stop. Yep. So you need to have a stop at the end of a gene, right? Basically that tells the, uh, the polymerase, okay, stop here. This is the end of our gene, right? Otherwise, you've got more and more and more genes on the chromosome and you just make this huge, long messenger RNA that wouldn't really make anything, right? So you need a start, which is met, and a stop. So if you look at the pattern of colors in the amino acids, do they look familiar to you? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yep. So what's, what's the pattern? Two? Hydrophobic. Two hydrophobic, two hydrophilic, and then two hydrophobic, right? Uh, does everybody have that pattern? Does somebody not have that pattern? Yep. So you three have the mutated beta gene. So instead of two hydrophobic, two hydrophilic, two hydrophobic, what do you have instead? So two hydrophobic, three hydrophilic, one hydrophobic. Got it. So you've switched a hydrophobic for a hydrophilic, right? So now the pattern, the pattern isn't right. What do you think will happen to, uh, to this protein? Do you think it will work right? Probably not, right? You've changed an amino acid that's really important for that pattern, right? And that pattern is very important for how the protein actually fits into the membrane and kind of works with it. So probably not gonna work, right? But we have some alpha mutations as well. Who has alpha mutated? All right. Do you have that two, two, and two pattern? Yeah, yes. Yes? Okay. So where is your mutation? What number? Six. Six. So that's in your second codon. So what, uh, what is your second codon? What are the three letters? CCT. So everybody look up what does CCT code for? Proline. Proline. Yep. All right. These are normal alphas. What do you have as your second codon? The letters? CCC. CCC. What is CCC code for? Proline. Proline. Yep. So if you look in, if you look in your book, you can see that there are many amino acids. Proline is one of them, where there's more than one codon that actually codes for that amino acid. So with proline, you have CC, and then you could have any of the other four nucleotides. It doesn't matter A, T, G, or C and it would still code for proline. This is one of the ways that our body deals with the fact that we are all mutants, many times over, right? It has sort of these, these error, like correcting mechanisms, right? And one is that similar, similar codes often code for the same amino acid. So depending on where you get that change, you might actually end up with the same amino acid. So, these uh, proteins that came from the mutated alpha gene, are these going to work properly? Yes. Yeah, they should. They're exactly the same amino acid sequence, right? They'll fold the same way. They're exactly the same as the originals, right? So these are called silent mutations because when you look at the protein sequence, there's actually no change at all. You wouldn't know unless you actually looked at the DNA that there was a base pair change. These, however, these beta mutations that probably will make a non-functional protein, uh, these are called missense. Yeah, when you change one amino acid to another. 
So, pro so mutations can be bad, they can be neutral, or sometimes they can be good, but it's pretty unlikely. It'd kind of be like opening a book and at random changing one letter somewhere in the book and having it make, a, uh, having it make more sense. Pretty unlikely. Sometimes it happens. It is important to make time during class to ask students for questions. When students ask questions, it means they are engaged in the lesson and want to learn more, which is great. Remember that questions do not have to be clever or complex to be important. A student asking a simple question might be confused, and it's very likely that other students in the class have the same misunderstanding. Make sure to thank the student for asking and acknowledge that others might have the same question. This encourages other students to ask questions and correct their misconceptions. Students often ask questions about the following topics. These are included in DNA RNA Booklet 2. Additions and deletions, frame shift mutations, DNA repair, and DNA damage. We're gonna do transcription first. So uh, go ahead and grab uh, your cards, mix them up so it's not easy for the, uh, the next group who uses them. Put them back into, uh, into, your into your bags and Kathy's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kathy's also gonna pick up your gene strips. Please don't take your gene apart. We're gonna use it to, uh, to build some messenger RNA in just a minute. We kind of went through a, a shortcut basically. So that's not how the body actually reads amino acids. We just took this nice little shortcut just to see what the end protein would be so we can see what the results of the mutations would be. But how the body actually does it is it goes through something called the central dogma, which is what? DNA to RNA to proteins. Yep. So we're going to make an RNA copy of the information in this gene that we will move out of the nucleus to a ribosome and then that will be translated by the ribosome into amino acids. So we're going to do this whole process, but the first thing we're going to do is transcription, which is make an RNA copy of the DNA. So what's the first thing we're going to need to do if we want a copy? Yep. So go ahead and pinch and pull up on your DNA sequence to split it apart. In transcription, it is essential for students to know which of the two DNA strands will be used to create messenger RNA. Numerous vocabulary words and diagrams can confuse students. Working with the hands-on models provides clarity. Student teams make a choice to base pair the first three RNA nucleotides with either the top or bottom DNA strand. Students benefit from making this conscious choice about mRNA and base pairing. Lead a discussion about which choice is correct. This activity will help students realize their misconceptions. The key point to repeat to your students is, the sequence of mRNA should be the same as the gene. So I have a question for you, and don't answer it. I just want you to think about it, talk about it with your partner, and then decide what you want to do. So uh, which side of the DNA had the information? Which side did we read? The bottom, right? All right, so what I'd like you to do is take some of the mRNA nucleotides and decide whether you think they're gonna clip in and base pair with the top or with the bottom. Just three. Just the first three RNA nucleotides. On the left, are they gonna base pair with the top or the bottom? Make your guess and click them in. So yeah, you just wanna take all these apart. We know that we wanna make RNA. And she's asking you to bring in three of the RNA pieces. So whatever they should be. Either you're going to bring them in to, to make a copy, you're either going to bring them in down here, or you're going to bring them in here to make the copy. 
So just make a best guess. Because a lot of people are not sure, so we're asking people to make a best guess of how to bring so in the first three. Everybody got a guess? Okay, who base paired with the bottom? Who base paired with the top? The minority was correct. So, so let's go through this. So you read the bottom strand of DNA, right? That's the part that has the correct information. So if you want a copy of that bottom strand, you have to pair with which side? The top strand. You have to pair with the top, the new RNA with the top strand. So it will read exactly like the bottom strand. The MIT Edgerton Center presents transcription to be used with the MIT Edgerton Center DNA set. Transcription is the process of copying a gene using RNA nucleotides. Position your DNA as shown with the gene on the bottom. The ATG codon is on the left. Unsnap the two strands of DNA by pinching and pulling up. Pair the RNA nucleotides with the top strand of DNA. Notice that the T in DNA is replaced by U in RNA. Continue unsnapping the two strands of DNA by pinching and pulling up. Follow the base pairing rule to add RNA nucleotides. Remember to use U instead of T. The single-stranded RNA created during transcription is called messenger RNA, or mRNA. The mRNA will be the same sequence as the gene. Check your mRNA strand with the bottom strand of DNA. It should be the same sequence, except each T is now a U. Unsnap the mRNA strand from the DNA strand. Now the mRNA is ready to leave the nucleus and attach to a ribosome, where the protein will be made. Snap the DNA strands back together. DNA opens and closes as needed for transcription. You're going to base pair with the top to make an exact copy of the bottom. The right? The gene. All right, while people are finishing up building, there are three main differences between DNA and RNA. What are the three main differences? Yeah. Um, the T turns into a U. Yep, so we don't have thymine as a base in RNA. We have, yeah, uracil. Uracil, yep. So we have U instead of T. What else? It's generally a single strand instead of a double strand, although generally RNA isn't just floating single-stranded. It actually makes these interesting loops and structures like within itself, but it's not a double strand generally like DNA. So that's two. What's the third? The sugar is Excellent. The sugar is ribose instead of deoxyribose. So what do you think is the difference between ribose and deoxyribose? One's got oxygen and the other doesn't. <laughs> Close. One's got one more oxygen. So the ribose, or rather the deoxyribose, has one fewer oxygen than the ribose, right? Is oxygen generally a reactive molecule or a reactive atom? Really? Oxygen? Yes, it is. Yeah, right? It burns. Like, <laughs> it loves being in reactions with lots of things. So, 
if oxygen is reactive, do you think the one with more oxygens or fewer oxygens is more stable? Yep, so that's good. DNA is actually more stable than RNA. Quite a lot more, actually. If you guys, I don't think you're gonna do this in your, in your labs, but if you ever try and isolate RNA in a lab, it's very, very, very hard to do. <laughs> you have to be extremely careful because RNA is very, very unstable. But DNA, you can you know, isolate yourself uh, at home with some salt and some water and some detergent, basically. Right, DNA is, is really stable. Okay, so what process did we just complete? Transcription. This is transcription, right? So scribe means to copy. So we've copied the information, right? If you haven't already, please pull up the bottom strand of DNA right under your messenger RNA and double check it's exactly the same sequence except T's except U's instead of T's. Yeah, we don't want any uh, unintended mutations. Okay, so now we've made a messenger RNA copy. Now what happens? Yeah, yep, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to split it apart from the DNA. So go ahead and pinch and pull up. What happens to the DNA? Goes back together, right? Those double strands go back together. And now what's going to happen to the mRNA, the messenger RNA? What's going to happen to it? Yep, it's going to leave the, where is it now? Nucleus, it's going to leave the nucleus and it's going to head to a ribosome. Excellent. Okay, so now we're going to take our short break, 10 minutes, uh, and then we're going to come back and actually do translation. <laughs>